Hey students, welcome to Sustainable Energy. I'm Rudy Schlaf, a professor at the Electrical Engineering Department at USF. This is part one of the nuclear energy segment. In this segment we will discuss the origin of nuclear energy, radioactive decay, nuclear reactions and fission, fission reactors, and subtopics there will be fission reaction products and nuclear waste. Let's talk first about nuclear reactions and radioactivity. These two terms are often confused in the public discourse. So when we talk about radioactivity, we refer to a spontaneous process during which a instable nucleus spontaneously sends out radiation and degrades into a more stable nucleus. The types of radiation that can be sent out in this process are alpha particles, these are helium nuclei, so essentially these are chunks of this degrading nucleus that consist of two protons and two neutrons. Then we have beta radiation, there is beta plus and beta minus. Beta minus is electrons that are emitted and beta plus are positrons. Positrons are the antimatter counterpart of electrons. Either parts occur when a neutron converts into a proton or vice versa. And then finally we have gamma radiation, which are photons, high energy photons. So this is a spontaneous process of an individual nucleus. So we have radioactive materials and these materials they send out these types of radiation. So this is called radioactivity. Now, nuclear reactions on the other side, they represent interactions between two particles, like chemical reactions where we react two atoms into a molecule which then has different properties. So here the prime example is fission. Fission is used in all commercial reactors to date. And in fission, we react individual neutrons with the fissionable material, which is usually uranium-235. That is the fuel in the reactor. So once the neutron hits this uranium nucleus, it becomes instable. It becomes uranium-236 for a brief moment. And then this instable uranium nucleus breaks up into two smaller nuclei. In this example, it breaks up into barium-141 and krypton-92. Also, we get three neutrons in this process because these neutrons, they don't fit into these krypton or barium nuclei. They make a way on their own and these are the neutrons that are being used for further reactions. So this is a chain reaction. Another way to make a nuclear reaction is fusion. And in fusion, we can take two smaller nuclei and combine them into something larger. Let's discuss first radioactive decay. So we just learned that radioactivity means that nuclei spontaneously decay into more stable nuclei while emitting radiation. This was discovered by Marie Curie in 1903 and she wrote her PhD thesis about this. Her basic experiment was to have a lead shielded radiation source and a magnetic field and then she put light protected photographic plates into the space in front of the radiation source and what she found is that on one side she got some signal then in the center and then on the other side there was also a signal and she determined that there were electrons, the so negative particles, they go in a different direction than positive particles in a magnetic field. So there must be electrons and positive particles and that was identified based on the trajectory as helium 2 plus ions, they were called alpha particles. And then in the center, we had something that was not influenced by the magnetic fields and that had to be neutral. And so what came to mind was photons. And this was called gamma radiation. An interesting term that is used to characterize radioactive materials is the half-life. Half-life defines the time that it takes until the radiation coming from a certain volume of that material is reduced to one half of the original value when we start the measurement. There are radioactive materials that have a half-life of minutes, 
and there are radioactive materials that have a half-life of 100,000 years. So when we talk about radioactive materials, it always depends on what is the half-life and what types of radiation are primarily emitted to determine how dangerous they are or how one needs to store them. Here's an example of a radioactive decay chain. This is for uranium-238, that is a radioactive material. The first step is emitting an alpha particle, and that converts the uranium-238 into a thorium-234. You know that the type of atom is defined by the number of protons that are in the nucleus. So uranium has 92 protons and thorium has 90. So the emission of an alpha particle, which consists of two protons and two neutrons, reduces the number of protons from 92 to 90, and that converts the uranium into thorium. So radioactive decay changes elements from one type into another. Over time, the number of protons is reduced in this chain, as you can see here. So there are many steps in this chain, and we finally end up at, at 82, and this is lead, and this is not radioactive anymore, and so the process ends. So this is a stable element. Now, it is possible to temporarily increase the number of protons through beta decay. So whenever an electron is emitted, we get a beta minus radiation event. Then, in that case, a neutron converts into a proton, and that increases the number of protons, and so we move higher on the proton number scale. So here's an example. We go from polonium-218 to astatine-218. Now we have the same number of nucleons because we didn't lose one. We only converted a neutral one into a positive one, which made this a different type of element. But the number of nucleons in the nucleus remains the same. That is the case for all beta minus decay steps, as you can see here. We always stay on the same number whenever the beta minus decay occurs. All radioactive decay chains have in common that we're going from higher proton numbers to lower ones until we reach a type of element that is not radioactive anymore. This also means that the world as a whole continuously reduces the amount of radioactivity because this process over time always ends up in non-radioactive elements. So over time, we lose more and more of the radioactive elements and we get more non-radioactive elements. Now I want to discuss nuclear reactions at the example of fission. All of today's nuclear power plants are based on fission. Most of them use uranium-235 embedded in uranium-238, and the typical grade of enrichment is 1 to 5%. The nuclear reaction occurs by shooting a slow neutron into a uranium-235 nucleus, which absorbs the neutron and temporarily creates a uranium-236 nucleus. This nucleus is instable, and so it breaks up into the reaction products, which are nuclei of about half the atomic mass and energy and three neutrons, in this particular example where barium and krypton occur. We will see on the next slide that there are several possible reaction products in this reaction. The chain reaction in a fission reactor is enabled by these neutrons, and these neutrons, they need to be slowed down in a moderator that they have the right speed to again get absorbed into a uranium-235. So each of these reactions gives us three neutrons while we started out with a single neutron. So if we let this go rampant, then every time this happens, we triple the number of reactions per time. Now this is what we would do in a nuclear bomb, because there we want to expand the energy as fast as we can. In a fission reactor, on the other hand, we are interested in a continuous operation at a controlled level. 
And so what needs to be done there is we need to capture two of these neutrons and only use one of them to react the next uranium-235. So we want a constant chain reaction where one event on average produces one further event. This is achieved by using a neutron absorbing material that is inserted into the reactor fuel. By controlling that insertion via a feedback process, essentially by measuring the temperature of the reactor core, we can keep this reaction constant. These are the infamous control rods that in Chernobyl, for example, got stuck and that disables this control mechanism, which resulted in an uncontrollable increase of the reactor core temperature with subsequent hydrogen explosions and emission of a large part of the radioactive material inside the reactor core. Now I want to discuss where the energy is coming from in nuclear reactions. It is actually a similar process like in chemical reactions. In chemical reactions, if you recall, we have individual atoms and we bring them together and a bond forms between the atoms. This is done by bringing the electrons into a lower energy state. In the case of a covalent bond, they go in between the positively charged nuclei and thereby act as glue, so to speak. This means that we go from a high energy state into a low energy state and this releases energy. If you look at this process on the energy diagram, electrons that have a lower binding energy go on a state that has a higher binding energy in the molecule. And that binding energy difference, that delta E, that is converted into kinetic energy of the molecules and we experience that as heat in the combustion chamber in a car, for example. In nuclear reactions we find that binding energy difference between nuclei that have different numbers of nucleons in them. So similar to the formation of atoms, when the electrons come together with the nuclei, binding energy is released. In the case of nuclei, the same thing happens when the nucleons come together. So at the beginning of the universe, separated nucleons came together and formed nuclei and released a certain amount of binding energy depending on what element they formed. So we get this binding energy curve of the various nuclei across the periodic system. So here on the right side we have the heavy elements like uranium-235 and 238 and on the left side we have the beginning of the periodic table with hydrogen and helium and lithium and, and so on. So you see that iron is the most stable, lowest energy nucleus, iron 56. And so if we take a heavier nucleus and cut it into two smaller nuclei in a fission reaction, then we move towards iron Right, the reaction products are somewhere here. And that means we get the difference of this binding energy as heat that is coming out of the reaction. The same happens when we do fusion, when we take some lighter elements and fuse them into something heavier, then we get this difference in binding energy released as heat. And so you see right here on this graph that when we do fusion, the amount of energy that we can get is considerably larger than the amount of energy that we get out of fission reactions because here we just move up the hill slightly while here is a really deep cliff on the fusion end of this graph. Maybe the most interesting aspect of this graph is the units on the y-axis. The average binding energy per nucleon is measured in mega electron volts. This means if we have a nuclear reaction that goes from this binding energy to that binding energy here, we release of the order of one mega electron volts in that one reaction. This compares to the average energy released in chemical reactions of one or two electron volts, single digit electron volts. So you see each nuclear reaction puts out about one million times the energy of one chemical reaction. This explains why nuclear reactors need very little fuel 
and can run for a long time before the fuel in the reactor core has to be replaced. Okay, now we know where the energy is coming from in fission reactions. Let's see what products we get when we fission uranium or plutonium, which are the most important fuel materials. Here on this graph we see the distribution of reaction products for the fission of uranium-235, 233 and plutonium-239. So we have the red, green and blue distribution curves. On the x-axis we have the atomic mass, so this is essentially the elements that are coming out of the reaction. And on the y-axis we have the percentage proportions of the individual elements. And so we see that for all three materials we get a fairly wide distribution of elements that are coming out of the reaction. Okay, now we know the reaction products. Let's try to estimate how much energy is coming out of one of these fission events. So I put the distribution of the reaction products curve from the previous slide on the average binding energy per nucleon graph that we already saw. And I scaled it that the scales would uh, match up of, the, of both of the graphs. So we can directly here draw lines and estimate that these two binding energies are the end products of the reaction. So if you look here at the fuels, uranium-235 and 238 are included in this graph. Plutonium-239 is also back here. So if you look at the difference between the binding energies of the fuel and the binding energies of the reaction products, we can say that each of these nucleons in the fuel releases a little bit less than a mega electron volt of energy. As a rough estimate, we can say that we get about 200 mega electron volt out of each fission event. So one nucleus fissions and we get 200 mega electron volt. That is a number that one really needs to appreciate. Because if you compare that with a chemical reaction between methane and oxygen molecules, so if you just take one methane and enough oxygens to fully react it into carbon dioxide and water, you get about 10 electron volts out of this chemical reaction event. So these 10 electron volts are about 20 million times less than the 200 mega electron volts. So this is the difference between the two reactions. This is just one nucleus. Here we have actually molecules that contain many nuclei and we only get 10 electron volts. So this difference of 20 million times one sees immediately if one considers the energy that was released during the Nagasaki bombing in World War II where the Fat Man atomic bomb fissioned about 1.1 kilogram of plutonium-239 and it released an amount of energy that is the equivalent of 21 million kilograms of TNT. So here you see it directly. You need just one kilogram of plutonium to have the same effect like 20 million kilograms of TNT. So we have an amount of plutonium that you could put in in a small pot and it has the same blast effect like 21 million kilogram of TNT which would be a pretty sizable chunk of material. So it's really a tremendous amount of energy that is in the nuclear reactions that can be released. We understand now that nuclear reactions release a lot of energy and of course it's very attractive to try to harness this energy here is a schematic of a fission reactor and in a fission reactor it's essentially like any other heat-based power plant we have a turbine that runs on steam and we have a cooling tower where we create a, a cooler temperature reservoir into which we can release the heat from this heat engine and we have a generator that, that generates electricity that's fed into the grid. The steam is coming out of the fission reactor and inside the fission reactor below this containment building we have the reactor vessel with the primary cooling cycle the heat from that primary cooling cycle is via a heat exchanger 
transferred into the secondary cycle where steam is produced that drives the turbine. Now the reactor vessel is where the uranium fuel is located and the chain reaction in the uranium fuel is controlled via the control rods that are able to capture a certain number of neutrons to keep this chain reaction stable. Let's have a look into the reactor core. The goal in a fission reactor is to have a constant and controlled chain reaction. So ideally we want that each fission event triggers exactly one subsequent one so that the thing burns at a constant rate. In order to achieve this we need to control both the neutron energy and the neutron density. The energy is controlled by a moderator material. So between the fuel rods we have moderator and that usually doubles as the cooling fluid. This can be done with plain water, heavy water made from deuterium oxide or lithium fluoride which is a molten salt. Now the number of neutrons available for subsequent fission events that is controlled by the control rods. So we have additionally control rods that we can stick between the fuel rods. The purpose of the control rods is to absorb a certain number of neutrons to ensure that each fission event only creates one further fission event. So by inserting them to a certain depth we can control the number of neutrons that are available to create fission events in the fuel rods. If one wants to shut down the reactor, one simply sticks the control rods all the way in and then most of the neutrons are captured and that makes the reaction subcritical and it starts dying down and if one waits for some time then the reaction gets really slow. Materials used for control rods are boron, hafnium, silver, indium, cadmium alloy and there are a few more. It's interesting to note that the accident in Chernobyl occurred due to a control rod failure. The events were that the cooling broke down so the moderator wasn't circulated anymore and everything got too hot and then the control rods bent and they got stuck as they tried to stick them into the reactor core. Once one cannot put them all the way in anymore it is not possible to shut down the reaction and that led to ever higher energy release from nuclear reactions which then subsequently created hydrogen gas and that led to an explosion that obliterated the containment vessel of the reactor and then a big cloud of reaction products from the reactor core was released into the atmosphere and across the globe. At the beginning of its life, a fuel rod consists of a small amount of fissile material, in this case uranium-235, and a matrix of uranium-238, which is non-fissile. So the only material in this fuel rod that participates in the chain reaction is the small amount of fissile uranium-235. During the life of this fuel rod, more and more of the fissile material is converted into fission products and the amount of uranium-235 declines to ever smaller levels. Now some of the uranium-238 is converted in this process to plutonium isotopes via a process called transmutation where neutrons are captured by the uranium-238 and the nuclei get larger which turns them into plutonium nuclei. Nonetheless, even though this plutonium is fissile, the total amount of fissile material inside the fuel rod declines below levels where the chain reaction can still be maintained. The reason for that is that the fission products and the uranium-238 act as neutron absorbing material which reduces the number of neutrons available for the chain reaction. This means that at some point the chain reaction slows down and the fuel rods need to be exchanged. At that point the fuel rods need to be stored until the radioactivity from the fission products has declined to safe levels. The length of time that this needs to be done depends on the half-life of the individual fission products. And you know now that there is a large variety of different radioactive elements that are among these fission products. It's interesting to note that a similar issue arises when nuclear power plants are decommissioned. 
because this effect of transmutation also makes the nuclear reactor structure itself radioactive after some time. This means that the primary circuit and the reactor core need to be treated as radioactive waste and they also need to be deposited in a safe manner. Here you see a typical transmutation chain. This is for the case of converting uranium-238 into plutonium isotopes. The first step is to add a neutron to the uranium-238 that converts it into a uranium-239. A subsequent beta event turns one of the neutrons in the uranium-239 into a proton and that gives us neptunium-239, so we created a new element now. A further beta decay event converts one more neutron into a proton and that moves us one step further to the right in the periodic system and we get plutonium and then add more neutrons and we can get higher plutonium isotopes. This process is used in so-called breeder reactors to convert non-fissile uranium-238 into fissile plutonium. One of the issues with uranium-based fission reactors is that the supply of uranium is relatively limited and most of the naturally occurring uranium is 238 and this provides a way to create more fissile fuel for reactors. This table lists the half-life of the most important reaction products that are in spent fuel rods. If you look at the half-lives that are listed, you see that there are vastly different half-lives depending on the elements. Iodine-131, for example, has a half-life of only 8 days, while Iodine-129, so an isotope of the same element, has a half-life of 15.7 million years. Now one can say that after about 10 half-life cycles, the material is gone. So that would mean that the 131 isotope of iodine would be gone in about 80 days. So you will not even find it in significant amounts in spent fuel rods, while you will find iodine-129 for a very long time in that spent fuel rod. The other elements have times in between. There are thousands of years, there are just years, and this makes it very difficult to deal with the radioactive waste of fission reactors. There are basically two routes. Either we just take the entire fuel rod and store it somewhere in a safe place and wait until the material with the longest half-life has vanished. So this means we need to store it for a very long time, millions of years. Another approach is to divide these materials into groups that have long, medium or short-term half-lives. This can be done with centrifuges or via chemical methods. Once that has happened, one can then treat more dangerous materials in a different way than less dangerous materials. This reduces the need for high security storage for the most dangerous materials because the amount of the to be stored material with that classification is reduced. Another way is to use nuclear transmutation, like I just discussed on the previous slide, to turn dangerous materials into less dangerous materials and then dispose of them. Now let's look at the waste disposal a little bit more in detail. This here is a chart that shows the mass flow in the uranium cycle. First we start out with the uranium ore, which has only a very small amount of uranium-235 in it. And so we need to enrich it that we have a few percent in the uh, fuel rods. So when we start out with 170 tons, then 20 tons would go into the fuel rods as enriched uranium and 150 tons would become depleted uranium which would find uses in radiation shielding because of its high density or also in defensive armor plating and armor piercing projectiles. So these 20 tons they go into the light water reactors and electricity is produced and after a while we end up with spent fuel rods. We saw now on the previous slide that we have some amount of fission products and also plutonium in there that can be used again as fuel if one desires so. Now in the US the spent fuel is directly slated for disposal 
and we will see on the next slide that we'll need to keep it for about a hundred thousand years until it can be considered environmentally benign again. In Europe, on the other hand, uh, they go through a reprocessing step where the plutonium is extracted and fed back into the fuel rods. The remaining material is still a mixture of highly radioactive materials and so also needs to be disposed for a hundred thousand years. Now the recycling step doesn't help with the, with the disposal issue because we still have pretty much the same amount. However, because the plutonium is being extracted, the fuel rods last longer and that means that less waste is produced per energy output of the reactor. So in a way it reduces the amount of waste that is produced per energy that's coming from the reactors. An interesting question is, how long does the waste need to be stored? We saw on the table that there are radioactive isotopes in the spent fuel rods that have a half-life of 15 million years or so. So do we need to store the waste for 15 million years safely or for a shorter period of time? And so the whole thing comes down to a consideration of dosage and dilution. As you know, the environment is full with radioactive materials in small traces. And when you drink water from the tap, for example, there is some radioactivity in it. Now bodies have learned to deal with this low level radiation. And so this can be considered safe there is no way around it. So when it comes to nuclear waste, we need to do a similar consideration. This is an interesting graph that I found. It shows the relative hazard of the nuclear waste materials relative to the uranium ore with which we start out. So the idea when it comes to assessing the danger that's coming from nuclear waste is how dangerous is that waste relative to the original uranium ore because uranium ore is natural and it's in the ground and obviously we can live with its presence. So it can be considered non-dangerous. And so to assess this relative hazard number or factor to relative to the uranium ore, one does the following consideration. We start out by asking how much do we need to dilute the uranium ore in water that we could safely drink it, that it would be as radioactive as regular tap water that we consider safe. And so we come up with a certain dilution, a certain number of liters per kilogram of uranium ore, and then we have a hazard level of one of unity. And then we look into the, the waste products that are in the spent fuel rods and we do the same consideration. How much would we need to dilute this mixture that we would end up with a radioactivity level that is similar to the uranium ore dilution. And so it turns out that for a fresh fuel rod as it comes from the reactor, when the rods are being exchanged, that has a danger factor, a relative hazard factor of about two or three thousand above the uranium ore. So this means one would need to dilute the spent fuel rod about two or three thousand times more than the uranium ore with which we started making the fuel rod. Now because of radioactive decay, over the years this mixture, this outer curve here, that's the entire mixture that's in the fuel rods, this mixture gets less and less radioactive and less and less dangerous. And so at about 100,000 years here, 10 to the 5 years, there's also a logarithmic scale down here. So 10 to the 5 years, we end up with something that's maybe two or three times more dangerous than the uranium ore. And that apparently is considered fairly safe already, even though it would take a million years until we are really at the uranium ore level. But here we are pretty close already and so it is said that about 100,000 years is the moment when the waste becomes benign, when its danger is similar to that of the original uranium ore. And so this closes the cycle, right? We start out with uranium ore, then we put it in the reactor, make this really dangerous mixture of isotopes in the spent fuel rod, and then over 100,000 years we're back to the original danger level of the uranium ore. And so this is considered the end point of the waste storage. So how do they envision to store these highly radioactive materials? 
Here you see a transport of caskets that contain highly radioactive material. These containers, they are multi-wall containers that are often evacuated on the inside to create a super dry environment. They are also made from stainless steel and other materials that resist corrosion. So the idea really is to keep the material inside here for a very long time before this container dissolves. Now, once these containers arrive at the storage site, which is typically a geological formation that is dry, they are lowered underground and then from tunnels they envision to make these holes in the floor and then sink these containers into these holes and then seal them with clay or some material like that. Once the storage facility is full, it would be sealed and then the material would be considered safely stored. In these schemes, it is assumed that this fancy container actually dissolves over some period of time. This can be just a hundred years or a couple hundred years. And then after that, the radioactive material would slowly distribute itself into the environment. Now, because this would be a dry formation, like a salt mine, for example, it would take a very long time until this material would make it out of these areas where it is stored and distribute itself into the environment. And so the idea is that this happens very slowly while the radioactivity is decaying anyway. And so after 100,000 years, the material is distributed, but also safe and only has a low radioactivity. The reality is that none of the countries that use nuclear energy have implemented such a permanent storage facility the main reasons are scientific, because it is difficult to find appropriate storage sites that really promise long-term storage in a safe environment. And the other reason is, of course, political, because no one wants to have such a facility in their backyard. So the current solution is temporary storage in pools. All nuclear power plants have pools that look like this here. This is actually a photo from La Hague, that's a nuclear fuel reprocessing facility in France. But nonetheless, even after they extract the still useful fuel from the spent fuel rods, most of the nuclear waste remains and they also have to store it. And so they have exactly the same type of pool like all the nuclear power plants around the United States have. And in these pools, the spent fuel rods are stored under a layer of water. Water is an extremely good radiation absorber, and so one could easily walk here without protective clothing above such a pool, and the radiation level would not be considered dangerous. The issue with this approach, of course, is that such a storage facility needs to be maintained. One needs to make sure that there is water in this pool, for example. In Fukushima, one of the things that happened after the earthquake and the tsunami was that the spent fuel pool, which was above ground, cracked and the water ran out. And this, of course, means that these fuel canisters heat up tremendously because they are still very radioactive. And so there's a lot of energy being expanded and they heated up and material was released because of that. So this requires attention and if we want to keep this type of storage for hundreds of years there needs to be a clear chain of responsibility that ensures that future generations will maintain these pools. So it's pretty clear that the lack of long-term storage and the need for ever more short-term storage in these pool type facilities creates a desire to reduce the amount of produced waste in the first place. The US produces about 2,000 metric tons of high-level nuclear waste every year, so it's clear that a solution needs to be found. There is a chemical process, it's called Purex, plutonium uranium extraction process, and in this process the high-level waste can be removed from the spent fuel rods and they can be enriched again and turned into newly usable fuel rods. The advantage of this process is clearly that the amount of waste is reduced because we reuse some of the fuel that otherwise we would have dumped and it also concentrates the high level waste and that reduces the amount of material that needs to be stored. So the facilities that are needed can be smaller but of course, the time that the waste needs to be stored is still the same. 
So this would extend the periods where we could live with temporary storage without having to extend it further. The downside of this process is that it uses technology that can also be used for making nuclear weapons and it creates the need to carry around the nuclear waste material around the country between the producing sites and the reprocessing sites. This creates safety issues and it also creates the need to build up another level of infrastructure. Maybe the biggest challenge with nuclear technologies in general is proliferation. The only difference between fuel rods and weapon grade material is the grade of enrichment. Weapons need to have fissile material that is enriched to a degree larger than 90%, while in fuel rods we need about 3 to 5%. Once one has the centrifuges in place to make fuel rods, one can also use them with little modification for making weapon-grade material. And so the technology needs to be controlled very tightly. But the reality is that nuclear technology is spreading out around the globe rapidly. Many countries are strongly increasing their nuclear energy programs. And it is perhaps a fantasy if one thinks one can keep this technology out of the hands of problematic states and individuals. This concludes part one of the nuclear energy segment. Thanks for watching.